it's meant for extremely large data, uh, data volumes, trillions of um, vertices and edges, high performance database with the lowest DCO you'll get anywhere in the market. Let's talk about what draft databases are and why should anyone care about draft databases? Why and how should developers and architects think about this? I'm going to give you the classic introduction to graphs and I'm going to mention the famous Koenigsberg bridges problem. And as opposed to other science, uh, graph science or network science or whatever it is you want to call it, actually can be pinpointed at a precise point in time uh, where there's pretty much universal consensus. That was the point in time where it actually started. So it was the 18th century and there was this famous uh, scientist and mathematician uh, from Switzerland, Leonard Euler, and she was working on this problem. And the problem was, how can you visit these specific parts of town uh, which is uh, through which a river runs and there's certain bridges on the river. And so what he wanted to do was basically find an algorithm that would enable him to visit specific points in that city with spending as little effort as possible. So by trying to formulate that problem, he basically invented graph theory. And that's where everything uh, started. From that point to today's graph databases, obviously there's some time and uh, some other things that, that have elapsed. So uh, when I talk about graph in general, I like to think of it in four different buckets or in a, a progression of shells. So it starts with graph analytics and which can help you solve that type of problem. And then from there, you move to graph databases. So there's many different you know ways of looking at that. Uh, the way I like to think about graph databases is that, well, it's a database that helps you model your problem as a graph. And so in addition to being able to do, uh, to apply graph, graph algorithms and do graph analytics, you're also able to do uh, what you normally expect out of every database. You can basically do the, your create, read, update, and delete operations uh, using a graph API. That's, you know, as straightforward as, as it gets from, uh, for, uh, for me. The world is by and large used to SQL and thinking about the world in tables and so on. So can you describe what, when you start to looking at a graph database, how do you think about the world differently compared to SQL, for instance, and what should architects and developers think about and what should be their approach be when they start looking at the graph data model? Classic databases, so, you know, SQL style databases, they think in terms of tables and you're intersecting sets in order to solve a problem. In graph databases, it's a little different. You think of yourself in the data and you're moving between connections. And this is the primary reason why graph databases have their own query language and didn't just go with an SQL derivative. It's because you're thinking of traverse, thinking of like percolating yourself amongst the vertices and edges in order to find data that's connected to you, the, the point that you started at in some kind of logical, semantic way. And then another thing that happens is that you start to think of your data as just one big blob of, of information, as opposed to a bunch of independent tables that you can then select from and intersect. So you have just a big world model, a heterogeneous set of things are connected in a heterogeneous set of ways. And the way in which you move through that data determines the results of your query. And they're isomorphic, meaning you can do SQL in graph and graph in SQL. It's just the, the expressivity changes the way in which you think about your data changes when you go into the graph model. And I suppose that's like what makes graphs kind of, a, for some of you, a hurdle, but for developers, it's like, if you want to get into graphs, you're starting to think about a new way of thinking. And so it, that's the hurdle comes with learning a query language that's different from SQL, thinking about how you parse your data, how you do entity recognition, how you represent your individual objects, how you relate them. It's a, a kind of like a new frontier in terms of dealing with data management. What are you seeing in the industry right now among database developers, architects, and decision makers in terms of interest in the graph data model and graph databases in particular. And what are you seeing in the industry right now in terms of graphs? Do you think it's starting to pick up or not? And do you, do, what do you have to share here? So your question, which is what's going on with graph today? So, well, since 2018, there's been lots of water that has, you know, flown out under the bridge, basically. So it went a bit like this. So initially, I think it was 2019 when it was like the first time that graph was actually included in Gartner's hype cycle. And that was, you know, like the official, okay, graph is a thing now. And you know what happens, obviously, when you get into the hype cycle. So you go up all the way up, up until, you know, the peak of inflated expectations. 
and then you know there's like this down it's all downhill at least for a while and then things stabilize so i think we're kind of a little bit still in the downhill phase right now so you know and uh, you know that the tech industry in general has seen some rough times you know there was this boom in funding and then a little bit of bust there were tech layoffs graph industry has not been unaffected by by any of that you know it has it had its fair share but overall uh, things are looking good and to back this up in terms of numbers i went into the trouble of actually looking up what the graph market was like in 2018 and what it's like today So in 2018, according to people who have these these numbers, the graph market, the graph database market specifically, of course, there's other adjacent markets as well, but the graph database market specifically was supposed to worth something like $700 million. And today it's supposed to be around $2.5 billion. So that's something like four times up within five years. It's pretty good. I mean, yeah. It started, you know, it started small, but it's growing, not exactly exponentially, but actually it's growing the way people forecasted that it would. You know, you had all this Cambrian explosion of NoSQL databases, and initially Graph was, you know, just just another NoSQL flavor, basically, and the newcomer, and people were not familiar with it and what it can do. Uh, but I think what's really powering its growth is the fact that, well, Okay, obviously, you know, there's we have more data every year and all of that stuff. It's been that point has been talked over and over again. But what's interesting is that not so much that we have more data, but people are, get to realize that well, it's not actually the volume of your data that matters so much. It's the connections, and graph is the best way that you can leverage connections, and that's what's fueling growth. I constantly hear that there are. Commercial solutions available out there, but they don't scale to the point that George made just now. They have more and more data that's increasingly getting more and more connected, but they don't have a ready-made solution out there which can scale to large amounts of data volume and still provide low levels of latency and high levels of throughput. So, can you talk about that? Like, why is it a hard problem to solve? And can you talk about that a little bit? The biggest problem with scaling, or one of the big hurdles that people get, is it's like called the super node. So graphs, uh, if you look at any kind of naturally evolving system, not all the elements in the system are, are considered equal, meaning that um, in the graph, some vertices will have lots of edges and, and most vertices have very few edges. Um, you look in social networks, there's, you know, there's very few popular people. You look at airport networks, it's, you know, there's the hubs in airports uh, around the world. So what happens when you go to model that or you put that in the graph database is that you have a particular vertex and then you have to store all those edges co-located with that vertex. And so you get these hot spots where your traversals, if you're traversing, they're always hitting the same. They're always gonna, ultimately going to be going through that same vertex. They're always going to be going through Denver International Airport. In essence, you know, it's a hub. And so whatever machine's representing that particular vertex, the Denver vertex is just getting slammed. One of the cool things that Aerospike's doing with the Aerograph is that uh, they are now the, the su- it's, it's called the super node problem. And the super node problem is partitioning a, a vertex, a heavy vertex amongst multiple sibling vertices. You have like vertices that, that once you aggregate them together, represent Denver, but then you've kind of partitioned Denver across multiple rows or records. So that helps with the super node problem considerably. And that's one of the big, one of the big hurdles with graph doing, you know, distributed representations and making sure things are efficient. And then the other thing is that you have to make sure your pointers, so graph databases, if you have a ver- vertex on one machine and it's referencing another vertex on another machine, you have to keep all that stuff in sync. So you have this bi-directional communication between all vertices that are connected. And so when you delete an, when you delete a vertex, let's say you delete an edge on one vertex on this machine, whatever vertex that, that edge is, you have to be well, well. So this notion of, of keeping all your, all, all your edges in sync so you don't get these half edges is a difficult problem. And then you get a lot of data consistency issues in some graph databases where you'll delete a, a, a delete edge, but the, the edge on the other vertex is still represented. They're called ghost edges, and you have to go through and clean those up. There's just a lot of various problems when you just have one single world model, and you don't have everything partitioned into individual tables. So all the complexities of having to manage that and dealing with that and making sure that the database that you are working with has a reasonable way of doing that. Most databases right now the graph databases, they, they're, 
you, you know, you, you tend to think of uh, your graph, you jump into a vertex and you start traversing around, you move through the graph. Where you jump into is always the question, and that's typically using indices. For example, I need to find a person whose name starts with N is under the age of 30. So those, that, that particular search is an index search. What's nice about leveraging Aerospike as the underlying uh, foundation for Aerospike Graph is that the indexing mechanisms in Aerospike are very, very nice. So you can just jump records um, efficiently and you can do compound index lookups. So, and you don't really find that in other graph databases. They typically have issues with that initial primal primary jump into the data and um, Aerospike just comes up there for free, which is nice. For people who are starting to evaluate graph databases or who have like a home drawn solution to do some sort of graph functionality, if they're looking to buy a commercial graph databases, what should what is some of the criteria they should be looking at to make this decision and what should that approach be? Well, well by season so I basically classify the, those criteria into two categories. So you have like hard or functional criteria and soft or non-functional criteria. So some examples of hard criteria would be obviously performance, scalability. I think that's typically, well, those and costs are basically typically probably the first ones that people will look at. But I also have to say that they're also very, very hard to actually evaluate in an objective way. I mean, the only real way you have to know whether certain solution is right for you, just get your hands on the solution you're looking at and actually do the evaluation yourself. That's the only way you can know. Having said that, there's also another set of kind of hard criteria. So uh, what kind of analytics rebuild algorithms come with your solution? That's one. So if you're interested in uh, doing knowledge, if, uh, in building knowledge graphs, well, some types of databases are better than others. And, you know, within those types of databases, some solutions are better than others. You also have things like support for integrated developer environments. So how productive you can be using your solution. There's things like how you can import and export your data, which is pretty important, by the way, when we're talking about something like graph, which is typically not the first, uh, not your operational database. So you have to somehow move data in and out of your graph uh, solution. And then you have a kind of typical soft criteria, I think like well, developer friendliness, uh, operational agility. So basically how many options do you have for running your database? Can you do it uh, on-prem? Can you do it in the cloud? Can you combine that? You know, Do you have Kubernetes and all of that stuff? How easy it is to run and maintain and so on. Community and support also is pretty important. So if you have a problem, can you look to a community to actually be like your first line of, of support? And then obviously you want to go with a vendor that's going to be there for you and, you know, it's going to help you deal with your issues and it's credible and won't just disappear and all of that stuff. So it's, it's a lot, I know. And this is why it's a topic in and of itself. And this is why I actually spend a lot of time writing graph database reports. Well, that's people can have a look in and kind of get started. Would you talk a little bit about that as to how Aerospike integrates with Thinkapop? In the past, making graph databases, for example, working on uh, Titan, which ultimately became Giannis Graph, a DSC Graph, which ultimately became, I think, called Data Stacks Graph at this point. I've learned my lesson in terms of the way to do things better. And one of the things is to make sure there's only one point of entry into the graph. This is using Gremlin bytecode. So there's always been this notion of you have, you can always just get the low level Java APIs, interact with low level Java APIs, or you can interact with the virtual machine, um, the Gremlin virtual machine. With Aerospike Graph, it's, there's no, there's no low level APIs. You just interact directly with the, with the virtual machine. That makes it real nice usability because now you can run all, all the different programming languages from Ruby to Python to JavaScript to C Sharp to Java. You can write in your native language and it compiles uh, down to Gremlin bytecode, you submit that and you get your results back. That makes it very user-friendly because you're the query language, the way the Gremlin query language is more like a meta language in the sense that it's not, it's a fluent language like method chaining. If your programming language supports method chaining, then you can write Gremlin expressions in your native language. So your code and your database queries are kind of one and the same. There's not this like a big fat string you send over like an SQL. So that makes it very user-friendly in that aspect. And also because most of the applications like third-party vendor applications that work with Gremlin bytecode, it just, uh, Aerospike Graph just works 
naturally with it, there, no, there's nothing funky. And we've done a lot of work with strategies, making sure that compile optimizations for Gremlin compile to optimize for executing against error spike. And that was, that's really nice. We have over some 20 different strategies that do compile optimizations specifically for graph. 